Hey, good morning, Encounter. We are so glad that you're here today, and especially happy Father's Day to all of our fathers and all of our men today. Come on, Encounter. Give our dads a big hand today. So glad you guys are here today. And uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to just be an awesome, awesome day. So thank you so much for being here. Let's pray. We're going to jump right into the word. Father, thank you for another opportunity of being in your house today. I pray, God, that you open our hearts, our minds, our, our spirits, God, to receive from you tonight or today what you have for us. And I thank you, God, that you're going to change us and you're going to move in our lives, God, as you always do in your presence, God, and your word always changes. So thank you that we're going to walk out here different than we, than we were when we came in. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen, amen. All right, so I'm going to uh, teach today primarily to the men of the church. Ladies, this obviously is going to be something that you can take and you can apply to your lives. But, but being Father's Day weekend, I just really felt like it was very, very important to speak to the men today. And so I want us to look at some things today that I think are going to help you and are going to challenge you, I think, in a lot of ways as far as how to be a man of God and some of the things that you need to do in your life in order to become the relentless man of God that God has called you to be. So let's start in 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> it says this, 1 Corinthians 16 says, be watchful and stand firm in your faith and act like men. I like that. Act like men, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. And notice how, notice what Paul does here. He's saying, act like men, be a strong man, but be someone who operates in love, Right? Okay, and you, you see a lot of strong men a lot of times, but not, not guys who operate in love. So be a strong man who operates in love. So what does it mean to act like a man? And, and quite honestly, when it, comes, when it comes to that statement, most men don't know because they weren't taught how to be godly men. A guy was asked one time, I thought this was interesting, he was asked, he said, well, you know, they were out shooting, shoot, shooting some guns, and the guy said, hey, where's the target? And the guy with him answered, he said, well, he said, shoot first, and wherever you hit, that's where the target's at, right? <laughs> but, and that's how, that's how, quite honestly, we treat life a lot of times, and certainly how, man, how men treat becoming a man of God. And it's a problem that, that men have learning how to become godly men. There's no target. There's, there's no direction. And that's what I hope to give you tonight is some direction. I want to talk to you about becoming a, re, a relentless man of God, somebody who pursues God with everything within them. And I want to talk to you about five things that we can do to do that. Most guys grow up in a team, team atmosphere. Whether you played football, baseball, basketball, part of a band, all of it is the same, all of it is the same thing. You're all trying to do something together. You're all working to the same goal. You're all doing it in unison, whether it be a touchdown, you're, you're marching the show, you're making a basket, whatever it is, you're all working together. And as a group of guys, if, if something goes wrong in the play, if something goes wrong in the show, whatever the case may be, you've always got positive affirmation around you. Come on, we'll do it. We're gonna pick it up. Let's get it done. We can do all all of those things. And then, then there comes a time in our lives when we grow out of that, we, especially if you didn't play sports or do anything beyond the high school ages, then when you get out of high school, you've kind of grown out of that, some, that, that period where you've got a lot of positive affirmation around you to keep you moving in the right direction. And I think it's one of the places, quite honestly, that I feel like the church has failed in some ways, and that is not really affirming men the way the church should have affirmed men over the years. And that's why, quite honestly, that we have a lot of women leading in the church. And women, I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful that you've been willing to step up. I'm thankful that you have prayed the way that you have prayed over years and years and years. But the truth is, is that it's not your role, it's the man's role to step up and lead in that position. Amen? Okay, it is. It's the man's role to do that. Of course, right alongside, right alongside with women, there's no question, but women shouldn't be the ones having to step out and lead in this area. We've got to lead men as people who are spiritual. Okay, we, we've, got to, we've got to get beyond just the macho thing, and we've got to recognize that, yes, we are men, and we are strong men, but we are men who walk in gentleness. We are men who walk in love. So what does the world say a man looks like? This is what the world says. The world says if, you, if you're truly a man, you're somebody with financial success. That's who you are. You, you've got great financial success. Okay, now remember, we're talking about the world standard here. Here's another thing the world says. If you're, if you're a man, this is what you are. You are athletically dominant. You've got the look. 
You, you've, got, you've got everything that you need from head to toe with the look and, and the athleticism and all those kind of things. You've got money, you're athletic. And then the, the last thing that the world compares to who, who is a real man is this, that is sexual conquest, sexual dominance. So I'm rich, I'm good looking, and I can fulfill my flesh at any time in any way that I want to. And that's how the world defines a real man. And unfortunately, men in the church find themselves comparing themselves to that standard right there. And when they don't meet that standard, when they don't have the money that they think they should have, when they don't look the way that they think they should look, and, and, you know, and, and then all the, the sexual part of, of our culture that's out there, all the promiscuity, all the temptation, all of those kinds of things, and they don't match up to that, then a lot of times they feel discouraged, they feel disappointed, they have all of these things in their lives that they struggle with. And the truth is, that's not what God's looking for at all. In fact, when you start comparing yourself to this, and it really is in the context of where we are, I feel like as a nation right now, you find a land that is in judgment. And in Isaiah, it says this, God said this, he said, I will make boys their princes and infants shall rule over them. What's he saying here? He's saying, look, he said, it's gonna be mature, it's gonna be mature aged men in leadership, but because they never grew, they're really inside boys. They're really inside infants. And you got men leading, but they're acting like boys and infants. This is a problem when you begin to compare yourself to the wrong standard, when you compare yourself to the standard of the world and not the standard of the word. Ecclesiastes says this, look what it says. Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child and your princes feast in the morning. Woe to you. So what's it saying? What it's saying is that woe to you when your leaders who are men are more concerned about themselves than they are anything. Because when it says princes feast in the morning, basically what it's talking about is what, what happens when a child first wakes up? What do they want? I want to be fed, right? I want, to, I want you to feed me now. Feed me now. They don't, they don't care about anything else. I want you to do for me what needs to be done. Why are they that way? Well, they're immature. They got to grow up. But when you become a man, you shouldn't be acting that way. And this is how a lot of men act. And it says, happy are you. O land, when your king is the son of nobility and, and your princes feast at the proper time. So what's it saying? So that when, when you grow up, now you've matured and you've gotten to a place where you're leading well and you're eating at the proper time for what? For strength and not for drunkenness. So you're not trying to please yourself anymore. Other things have become more important to you. Leading has become more important to you than fulfilling what it, your, own, your own stuff on the inside of you, your own flesh. We've got to start comparing ourselves, guys, to the word and not to the world. And we've got to be relentless. We've got to start going after this. And I want you to write this down. We've got to learn to be relentless in our pursuit of becoming the man that God wants us to be. We've got to go after it. We've got to determine within ourselves, we're not going to care what anybody else is going to say. We don't care what they think about us. We're going after God with everything that's within us. You say, well, what does relentless mean? I love what this means. Relentless means this, to be constant. To be constant, constant in what? Constant in prayer, constant in reading the word, constant in worship, constant in, in attending the house of God, constant in being in small groups, constant in doing everything that you can and leading your family to the things of God. You're incessant, you're intense about it. You're persistent with it. When you're relentless about something, you mean business. Okay, and that's why, that's why I chose this word for, for today to celebrate this weekend because every time you see this t-shirt, I want you to think about how important it is for you to be relentless in your pursuit of God, that you don't give up, you never stop, you go after it with everything that's within you. Because stats say this, stats say that when, when a child gets saved, there's a small, very, very small percentage that the whole family is gonna come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. When the mom gets saved, the percentage goes up. I don't remember what it is. It seems, seems like it's somewhere in, the, in like the, maybe the 20s, high 20s, low 30s. That's, you know, percentage, 30% chance, let's say, that the whole family will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. But when the man gets saved, 93% of the time, 93% of the time when the dad gets saved in that household, does the whole family come? Why? Because now all of a sudden the leader, something has changed in the leader and now he's gonna lead his family to the things of God. So if we're gonna become relentless men of God, if we're gonna pursue God with everything that's within us, number one, you need to do this, you gotta step up. 
Men, you gotta step up. It's time for you to lead. It's time for you to initiate. It's time for you to take action. It's time for you to assume that it's your job. Assume that it's your moment. It's time for you to hate apathy. Quit being lazy spiritually. Quit being lazy in your leadership, in your home. In Ezekiel chapter 22, God was really frustrated with the nation of Israel. And and the prophets and the princes and the priests were all messed up. The prophets, they weren't weren't telling the people the true word of God. They were were trying to sugarcoat it in every way because the people didn't want to hear the true word of God. They They wanted their ears to be tickled and the prophets were doing that. The priests in the temple, they weren't acting the way they were supposed to act. They weren't serving the people and serving, serving the kingdom of God the way that they should have. They were, they were more, desired, more desirous of their own issues and their own things in their lives. And then the princes were doing the same thing. They cared more about their flesh, more about what they wanted than serving the people. And this is what was going on in Ezekiel chapter 22. And God said this, he said, I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But look what it says, I didn't find anyone. I didn't find anyone. I didn't find anyone who was willing to step up to the plate and become and defend the things of God and defend the kingdom of God the way that they should. I didn't find anyone. And my question to you is, would God find you? Would he find you stepping up? Or would he find you shrinking back like so many men do in our culture today, shrinking back because they don't want anybody to think something weird about them because they believe in Jesus. They don't want anybody to think they're some kind of fanatic because they go to church. And so, so they live in this culture and they live in this environment and they shrink back when they should be stepping up. And Chronicles says this, that the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are what? Fully committed to him. That's what God's looking for. He's not looking for your financial success. He's not looking for your athletic look. He's not looking for your sexual dominance. He's looking for guys who are fully committed to God. That's what he's looking for. He wants you to be spiritual. That's what he's most most concerned about in your life. Not all the things you accomplish or how you look. And and, and I'm not saying self-discipline and all those kinds of things are important in our lives. I'm not saying they're not important, but they are not priority to God. Like our culture makes them. And that's why I'm saying you've got to start comparing yourself to the word and not to the world. D.L. Moody, a guy came up to him one day and and he said, D- he said, D.L., he said, the world has yet to see what God can do with, it, with a heart that's fully devoted for him. And in that moment, it was said that Moody decided that he was going to become a man who was fully committed to God and watch what God could do. And God used D.L. Moody to bring revival to this nation and the nations of the world because he fully committed himself to God. Are you there? Think about it. Only you can answer that question. No one else in this room can answer it for you. Only you and God know. Are you committed? You say, well, God can't use me the way he used D.L. Moody. Yes, he can. You know how many people in the Bible said that they, they couldn't be used by God? When God went to Moses and said, I want you to go stand before Pharaoh. He went to Moses and said, I want you to go stand before Pharaoh and deliver my people who've been in bondage for 400 years. And Moses said, well, bye-bye, bye-bye, I can't, I can't, because I stutter, stutter, stutter. And God said, it doesn't matter. I'll fix it. We'll put Aaron beside you. We'll make it work. When he walks into Gideon, Gideon is the least of the, the, his family is the least of families in the least tribe of Israel. And he walks into Gideon and he says, mighty man of valor. And Gideon says, are you kidding me? Really, me, mighty man of valor? But God still used him. David, when Samuel showed up at Jesse's house, David wasn't even called in. Everybody else lines up in the line. Samuel goes down the line, can't find anybody that God is saying, this is the next king. He's like, dude, is there anybody else? Well, yeah, there's David out there. And what Jesse didn't know is that David had been sitting on a rock out in the field for the last two or three years, developing a relationship with God like no one ever had before, to the point that he's called a man after God's own heart. I'm telling you, God can use you. Doesn't matter what you think is going on in your life, it doesn't matter how, how, how insignificant you are, God can use you if you'll fully commit yourself to him. We've gotta be men of action who'll step up, amen? Proverbs says this, many a man proclaims his, his own steadfast love, but a faithful man, who can find a faithful man? Lots of guys will say, I wanna be a man of faith, I wanna be, I wanna be a godly man, but they don't execute on their words. 
What makes a man ultimately great in God's eyes is a man who will execute on his words, who will do what he says he's gonna do, amen? James chapter one says this, be what? Doers of the word. Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone's a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intensely at his natural face in a mirror and he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets, forgets what he was like. Guys, I want you to think about this. Every morning, most women, when they get out of bed and they go to the mirror, they take a tackle box of stuff with them. Right? Why? Because they're going to deal with what they see in the mirror. They're going to deal with it. Guys, get out of bed, your hair's all messed up, scratching this, scratching that. Sounds coming from wherever. You go brush your teeth, you stand in front of the mirror, you're like, yep, it's all good, baby. And you're unwilling to deal with what you see in the mirror. You're unwilling to deal with it, and that's the problem. We don't have enough men looking in the mirror of God's word. We don't have enough men doing that. And we certainly don't have enough men that are looking into that mirror of God's word and being corrected by it and working on it. It's time to step up, guys, amen? It's time to step up and be a godly man. Somebody who says, I wanna bring an awakening to this nation. I, I want God to use me at my job. I wanna see the people around me brought to the saving knowledge of Jesus. And, and you say, Brent, that's what I want. That's what I desire. Then this is what I would say to you. Get on your knees, draw a circle around yourself and then ask God to change everything inside that circle. Because he, when he begins to change you, then he'll begin to change everything around you. Most men are wondering when other men are gonna get up and lead. And the truth is that person needs to be you. You gotta step up. Number two, we gotta step out, step up. And number two, we gotta speak out. We gotta be courageous. We gotta fear God and not man. We gotta speak truth in love. When you speak out, you're not trying to build a group of followers. But instead, you're, you're trying to speak grace and truth, the grace and truth of God to the people around you. You wanna, you, wanna be, you wanna be theologically correct, but you don't wanna be politically correct. You wanna stand for God's word, not what culture says is right. You wanna speak it, though, in kindness and in love. It's the kindness of God that brings people to repentance. Silence, listen to me, guys. Silence in the midst of sin is sin. When you just stand and watch sin around you all the time and you don't address it and you don't confront it in love, silence in the midst of that is sin. You gently and humbly, you don't confront it, you don't confront it aggressively, but you gently and humbly confront friends around you that are living that way. Why? Because you care about them. You care about them. And you don't want that person, I, I said this to you a few weeks ago, I just wanna remind you, you don't want that person ending up in hell one day thinking to themselves, why didn't that person that I knew was a Christian ever tell me about this? Because I will guarantee you that's gonna be the thought of many, many people that find themselves in hell. They're gonna be saying, why, why did somebody tell me about this? One of the greatest reasons men, men live lives of compromise is because they surround themselves with friends who don't love them, and don't care how they live. And quite honestly, there's only two people that will tell you the truth about yourself in this life. One's an enemy who's lost their temper and nobody wants to hear from that person and a friend who loves you dearly. Proverbs 27, seven says, or 17 says this, iron sharpens iron so a friend sharpens a friend. Guys, if you don't have guys around you that you will let the strength of their life rub up against the strength of your life, you're gonna stay in dysfunction. Hear me. I know this is a challenging message, but I want you to hear me. It's time that you step up and you start becoming the relentless man of God that God has called you to be. I need guys around me and I have guys around me that speak truth into my life. We've got to love each other enough to tell each other the truth. I love Proverbs 27, verse 6. It says this, wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an, from an enemy. You need people around you that would say to you, you know what? This might cut a little bit. This might hurt a little bit. But I want you to know this is what I see in your life. And because I see this in your life, I care enough about you 
to tell you what I'm seeing. I want to confront this and help you through this. It's who we need around our lives. Isaiah says this, this is what the Lord says to me. With a strong hand upon me, Isaiah said, warning me not to follow what? The way of culture. Not to follow the way of culture. Not to be wrapped up in everything that culture says is right. Look what it says. Not to call conspiracy everything that culture calls conspiracy. This is what he's talking about. Not to fear everything that culture says you're supposed to fear. Not to dread everything that culture says that you're supposed to dread. No, our job as men, our job as relentless men of God is to know that God is the one that who, who we regard as holy. Nothing else, he is the one who we fear and he is the one who we dread, amen? He is the one. We don't care what anybody else thinks. We don't care what culture says. We don't care if they call it conspiracy. We don't care what they say about that. We're not gonna be moved by that because we're driven by our relationship with God and not our relationship with the world. That's why Romans 12 says, don't be conformed to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You gotta speak up, you gotta step up and speak out. Proverbs 31 says this, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. But you think about it, guys. Who's gonna, who's gonna speak for the babies in the womb? Satan's trying to kill every one of them right now. Who's gonna speak up for them? Speak up, it says, for those. And and by the way, most people, when they think about Proverbs 31, they think about the virtuous woman. But can I tell you, the beginning of that proverb starts and speaks to guys. This is who he's talking to. Speak up for those who can't speak for themselves, for for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Pastor Niemöller, a guy that was caught up in the Holocaust and in Germany, Nazi Germany, and he began to speak out against Nazism and all the things that were going over there, and he began to preach the gospel and found himself in jail. As he found himself in jail one day, this young man runs in and he sees him, sees him in the jail cell, never expecting to see Pastor Nemo there, and he, he walks over to him and he said, Pastor Nemo, he said, what are you doing in prison? I mean, you're one, of the, you're one of the nicest guys I know. How in the world did you end up in prison? And Pastor Nemo was in there because he'd been preaching the gospel and he looked at the young man and he said, he said, I know why I'm in here. He said, but why are you out there? And his point was this, is that I'm in here because I'm speaking up you're out there because you're not. You've got to speak up. First Peter 3 says, in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to what? Give an answer to everyone who asks you to give for the reason of the hope that you have. But do it with what? Gentleness and respect. Speak up. Speak up. Number three, we need to step up. We need to speak out. We need to stand strong. Don't give in when you're challenged. Don't give in when you're attacked. Don't give in when you're criticized because it's gonna happen. We need men of God who are gonna gonna stand strong. They're not gonna be moved. Jeremiah, God said this to him. I want you to go in and, and declare some things to Israel and the nation's messed up. Jeremiah's, I don't want to do this. This is going to be tough. All these kinds of things. This is what God said to him. He said, Jeremiah, I've made you a fortified city. I've made you an iron pillar and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, the people of the land. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you, for I am with you and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. Almost every great man in the Bible Especially in the Old Testament, God would call them to do things and they would struggle and say, God, I'm, I just don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I, if, I, if I should do this. And God always would encourage them with this. And I want you to be encouraged today, guys, as you think about standing strong in the midst of a culture that says it's, you know, it's anything but right to stand up for the things of God. But God would say the same thing he said to Jeremiah, to you, the same thing he said to Moses, the same thing he said to Isaiah, all of these guys. He said this, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, I'll give you the words you need to speak and I'll be with you to deliver you, amen? If you'll just speak up and if you'll just stand strong and and not back off when you get criticized, not back off when you get persecuted. And see, we don't understand persecution in this nation. If I'm just quite honest with you, I hope we never have to understand it. Not the way the world does. 
Most of you, most of you are really quite honestly probably pretty oblivious to the fact that the majority of the world is being persecuted in ways that are unimaginable to Americans. They're giving their lives for the gospel of Christ. There's a story about two guys in, in 15, I think it was 1555, 1553, and, and Queen Mary has become Queen of England, and, and she was known as Bloody Mary because she had led like 200 different guys out who disagreed with her biblically, by the way, and she had them murdered because they didn't, they didn't believe the way she believed. She believed you could only be saved by the church and there was a revelation that had come that you, that you would be saved by grace, that you were saved by the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and she only believed you could be saved by the church and so she had them all killed. She was burning a lot of them at the stake and these two guys, Latimer and Ridley, they stood up for the grace of God and, and believed that this revelation that God had, had brought to them, and it was the right revelation, that we're saved by grace. And they began to preach it, and they began to declare, declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Mary didn't like it, and so she, she had them brought out to the stake together. As they were walking along, both of them said, would you please take off our clothes and all of our valuables, and would you give to the poor and the needy? These are guys who were relentless in their pursuit of God. They get tied together at the, at the stake and, and they're bound together hand to hand in the back and, they, and, and, and history says that as they lit the fire on Ridley's side, the, the wood was really green and so the fire, the fire was caught but it wasn't catching and blazing and so it was just slowly, slowly killing him but on Latimer's side, the fire took off and it, and it really caught on fire and he, he, he caught a blaze rather quickly and as, he, as Latimer was dying, I want you to think about this, the pain, the agony, everything that he's in. As he's dying, he leans over to Ridley and he, and he says it loud enough for the people around him to hear. He says, be of good comfort, Mr. Ridley, and play the man. And what he was saying, he's saying, be strong. That's what he was saying, be strong. Don't give up, don't back off, play the man. And he said, because this day, Light such a candle. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out. So what he was saying is that, look, he said, we're giving our lives for the cause of Christ and we're about to go to heaven. We're about to be with Jesus and we're about to start a revolution. We're about to start a movement that's gonna motivate people to stand up for the things of God like they never have before. Are you that type of person? Are you the type of person who will stand for the things of God that way? Look what Philippians says. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, Paul said, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, look what it says, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God. In other words... If you lived in the Middle East somewhere, you were pulled away and had, had a sheet thrown over your head being told to denounce Jesus Christ and declare that Muhammad is the prophet of God or you're gonna lose your head, how would you stand? I think it's an important question to ask because I think what's happened in our, in our churches of America is we've become very apathetic as men. Men are not stepping up the way that they should. They're not speaking out the way that they should. They're not standing strong the way that they should. And we want to change that starting today. Amen? Amen? Right? We want to change that. And it can change. Great men don't give in when they are attacked and criticized. These last two we'll quickly go through. Number four, stay humble. Step up, speak out, stand strong, and stay humble. No matter what we do for God, we're always being transformed. You're never gonna arrive, so don't let arrogance come in. Don't let pride come into your life. Being humble doesn't, you, doesn't mean you deny how God is using you. If somebody comes up to you and says, hey, thank you for, for speaking into my life, just say, you're welcome. I'm glad God could use me the way he did in your life. There's nothing wrong with that. There's, no, there's nothing prideful or arrogant about that. Just humbly say thank you. 
And the right definition of humility, by the way, is that you think of yourself less. You think of yourself less. Stay humble. David, in Psalms 141, he's the king of Israel. I love this statement that he makes because it showed where he was at because he could have been in a place of arrogance, he could have been in a place of pride, but this is what he said. He said, let a righteous man strike me, that's kindness to me. Let a righteous man rebuke me, that is oil on my head. And then he says this, he said, my head will not refuse it. What was he saying? My position that I'm in, the position of being king of this nation will never put me above a, a righteous man walking into my life and speaking into my life and rebuking me if I need to be rebuked because to me, that is valuable is what David is saying. Guys, you need to be in the same place always. You're not perfect. You haven't arrived. Every one of us have flaws. Every one of us have areas in our lives that need to, be, that need to change. Get guys, get men around you that you trust, that can speak into your life and that will gently and humbly and respectfully challenge you in those areas. And last one, serve the king. Step up, speak out, stand strong, stay humble, and serve the king. When you gave your life to Christ, you quit being your own, you became his. You quit building your own reputation at that point. You started building his reputation. Mark chapter 10 says that for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Matthew 6, says, seek first his kingdom, not yours. Seek first his righteousness, not yours then everything you need will be added unto you. Great men live for his glory, not their own. Great men live for his glory, not their own. Relentless men live for his glory, not their own. I want every man 16 and older in this room, I want you to stand. If you're watching by video this morning, I want you to do the same thing, I want you to stand. Guys, I just want you to, I just want you would, if you would just get in a receiving mode, I'd just maybe just bow your head and just hold your hands out. And I just want you to receive some things from God this morning. Father, I pray for every man in this room tonight. I pray for every man watching this video this morning. Father, I pray, God, that you help us to do these five things in our lives. Help us to step up. Help us to speak out. Help us to stand strong. Help us, God, to stay humble. Help us to serve you, to serve your kingdom above all things. Father, we commit to you right now. Guys all across this room, watching on video this morning, would you just begin to make this commitment? I am gonna be a relentless man of God. Come on, would you just begin to make that, Father? We, we make that commitment to you right now. Help us, God, to be the fathers we need to be. Help us to be the husbands we need to be. Help us to be the leaders, God, that we need to be. Help us to be those things. Help us, God, not to shrink back in any way, form, or fashion. I declare over every one of you that hear my voice right now, you are needed in the kingdom of God. You are needed. Your leadership is needed in the kingdom of God. Your anointing is needed in the kingdom of God. Your abilities are needed in the kingdom of God. The kingdom needs you to step up and start leading Step up and become the man that God has called you to be, relentlessly pursuing him with everything that's within you. And Father, we repent right now. Could you just do that all across this room? We repent right now, Father, for anything in our lives that have caused us not to be this relentless man, God, that you want us to be. Forgive us, Father, for shrinking back in the moments that we should have stepped up. Forgive us, God, for not saying something in the moments that we should have said something. Forgive us, Father, for not standing strong in the moments that we should have. God, we just want to be pleasing to you, and we thank you for grace. We thank you for mercy. And God, as Corinthians says, we're going to act like men. We're going to be strong, but we're going to be gentle. We're going to be kind. We're going to be loving. We're going to be respectful, because that's what a true man of God looks like. 
We're not gonna judge ourselves by the world's standard. God, just like 2 Chronicles said, we're gonna be men that are fully committed and fully devoted to you. Those are the men that you're looking for and God, those are the men that we're gonna be. Men that are fully devoted to you. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.